Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sermon Notes, a uh, chance to sit down and uh, talk to Brother Jared a little bit about uh, the sermon. Maybe we can go a little bit deeper. Maybe we can hit on some different topics. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Obviously, it's a, a small crowd up here today. Uh, Matt is, is uh, on assignment with Mighty Oaks uh, this week, so excited for him. He's really uh, uh, looking forward to getting up there. I think he's, he's uh, um, out of town doing that, so, so really excited for him. Um, and, and so somebody's going to have to drum up some conversation because me and Jared agree way too much. The argumentative one is not here. Uh, do me a favor. Please feel free to chime in on Facebook. We'd love to hear your comments or your questions uh, and kind of kind of revolve around that just a little bit. But, you know, Jared, yesterday's sermon uh, was, now, that's the beginning of a series. Correct. Right. Okay. Right. Very excited about this. I got to tell you, um, I my favorite part about all this is I I look upon you from my my pew over there like a proud mother bird watching the baby bird spread its wings. Whenever I see you pacing back and forth across the stage, preaching with your arms and talking really fast, oh, um, I, I feel like I have rubbed off on you in some small way when oh, you do that. Okay. Well, there there you go. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Uh, uh, but no, I, it was um, it was really cool, and, and it was interesting how I, I thought that the whole the whole service, the whole sermon, everything together really. Um, it spoke a lot to what you were talking about. You know, you, you really, your excitement showed the excitement that we have when we talk about God. You know, I think you, you started off by saying, um, if you love God, then you love hearing about God, um, and, and that we love praising God, and we love hearing about God being praised. You know, you, you reference that a lot in, when you're talking about the music, when, we, when you come in and, and, and that sometimes it's the music, or sometimes it's, you know, you, you, you talked about it with your kids and how you praise the kids, you're going to get in your good graces, um, and I thought that was really, really awesome because I thought uh, um, that the, the music section of worship yesterday was really cool. Um, just the, the, constant, the constant repetition of the holiness of God, uh, I, I thought was absolutely amazing. And so I, I got to give all credit to, to Brother Daryl. Brother Daryl never wants to come on camera, and so I would love to have him up here today. But yeah. all credit to Brother Daryl for, for um, uh, getting, getting everything kind of arranged in that sense. It, it, it's the more that I get to know Brother Daryl, the more that I'm realizing that there's much more of a science to putting together a worship service than, uh, than just picking out songs. Right. Well, Brother Daryl's been on camera. I think even this week he was on, uh, what was it you were on, Daryl? Okay, Operation Feeding Temple, Food Drive, and they had some new stations out there. So he, he's actually expand, gone far beyond our re- outreach, uh, the, the reach of sermon notes. But, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think that a lot of times uh, we come in, we kind of have a, uh, a misunderstanding of what worship is going to be like. And we were talking about emotionalism a little bit earlier. And we just think that if we're not there at that emotional high, then that's not real worship. And certainly that's perhaps our favorite kind of worship is when we are emotionally charged and everything's just clicking and we're just pouring out our, our soul before God focused solely on Him. That's certainly, you know, perhaps our favorite kind and perhaps even the deepest kind. But the reality is sometimes we come in, this is why we have corporate worship. We come in and because we love God, uh, simply worshiping with other people who also love God, hearing them praise God, being reminded of who God is and what he's accomplished for us through his son Jesus Christ and the redemption that we find in him. Through that, it, the way I like to think about it, it just kind of peels back layers, uh, the wall around our heart peels back layers to the point that perhaps by the end of the service we are there or at least we're closer there than we were when we walked in. And uh, for me, that that's big because... You know, uh, sometimes I can be moody, and I know early on in my ministry, I just had this very simple understanding of what worship looked like and uh, just had to be emotionally charged all the time. And, and that's not really what we find in the Bible. That's not really what we see uh, throughout the pages of the Bible. We see both, both sides of it. And uh, so I think that's one of the beauties of, of corporate worship. But yeah, if, if we love God, we love hearing about God, and that's going to stir our hearts uh, to love him deeper. Well, that's interesting. You, you, you talk about that we do. We see both sides of that. I think one of, that's one of the things that um, current, cult- church, current church culture um, really has to be aware of at times is that um, emotionalism is, is not the goal. 
Um, right. That that's you know always having that that wonderful tingly feeling is right. is not the goal. That the goal is is worshiping God. It's it's focus it's about coming it. in and having that focus on God. But but it doesn't mean that you're not going to have that emotional response right. to sure. that. I, I think you were you were pointing out earlier with Isaiah that Isaiah had a very emotional response right. to being in the presence of God. Um, right. I think that we can see um, you know in a, in a similar in a similar realm John's experience in Revelation. Um, uh, in, in Revelation 4, that there's an emotional response to being in the presence of God. Um, so it, it doesn't mean that you, you have to have an emotional response in, in that outward, uh, I call it tingly sense. I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and that's the thing is anybody who has, has sat in a service knows that, that uh, um, of, of the staff, I'm the emotional one. You know, I'm the one playing the guitar shimmying and moving in the background, uh, raising my hand when I'm not, when I'm not playing the guitar. And, and as, as Stephen Spin will tell you, sometimes I'm raising my hand when I'm supposed to be playing the guitar. <laughs> right. um, um, but, but that we, we do, uh, that, that, that we respond differently. In, in the sure. same way that, that, that um, you will get different responses from how people interact with you, um, that we respond differently the way that we interact with God. For me, it, it does. It just, it creates that emotional response, but it's, it's not the goal. And, and so when we look at, someone else. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily, you know, this is the thing. I, I think I always get concerned um, that, that somebody's going to think I'm trying to pick on anybody, but I'm, I'm really not. But I think in, in culture today, if you just look at Facebook and you look at the way that, um, that some people will interact and will talk about other churches, that just because one church is more emotional than another, um, if it's theologically based, if it's theologically sound, then that's okay. The, the way that they worship, the way that they interact might be a little bit different than us. We have, I mean, you can see the way that the, the differences that we have in our own our own sanctuary when we worship, uh, you know, I mean, we've got we've got people that, that that don't move a muscle and that their praise is largely largely or their emotional state is largely inward. And then we got people like me that can't sit still. Right. Yeah. I, th- I think it takes you know the the body. I think when healthy, it's diverse, and uh, I like not just being kind of a one tune band where we only do one style. We have kind of a multitude of different styles, blended styles uh, that we incorporate into our worship service. I like that because I think it, you know, it challenges us when it's not our preferred style. Uh, It challenges us to realize that, hey, you know what, this isn't a karaoke night to where everything's just going to be exactly the way that you, this is not about you. It's ultimately about God and it's about worshiping Him. It's about being outwardly focused, uh, you know, and not thinking primarily of self but thinking primarily of God and being focused on him and who he is rather than our preferences you know we're not to come in as though this is American Idol and we're Simon Cowell and we sit back and we judge and offer uh, approval or disapproval on what's going on Uh, we are to experience to engage God in worship and to be focused on him and I think I've fallen short of that many times in the past, there's certainly a, a a place for evaluation and things of that nature, but what should drive us in a worship service should be who God is, what God has accomplished, and there is a lot of emotion. As I mentioned yesterday, you know the way they would emphasize something was through repetition, and so Jesus would say, you know, truly, truly, I say unto you, and stuff like that to really drive that point home. And here we have, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And I, I see that as a very emphatic thing that uh, the uh, heavenly chorus is saying and exclaiming of God, that God is, this is who God is. He is holy, holy, holy. A powerful concept as we looked at yesterday. And uh, just speaking of God's uniqueness, his uh, transcendency, and uh, his moral purity you know it's just it's remarkable to think of who God is and I think we don't enough just sit and ponder who God is we receive too easily characterizations of God from society and a lot of times we end up conforming to those characterizations rather than the God presents us in the scriptures yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and it's nice to see. Um, first off, hello, Matt. Uh, Matt is watching and is keeping a, a close eye on us. I'm sure yeah, to make sure, as, as he said earlier, that we don't add anything to the word of God <laughs> like we do that often. Um, uh, but, but, you know, that's, uh, you know, and he's, you know, Matt says, he says, worship is based on the word of God and, and not 
our own opinions. Uh, kind of going along very similar to, to what you were saying is, right. is that we, we have to make sure that the, the main thing stays the main thing. And that when we, that, that one, I mean, God, I, I was about to say when we walk in here, but really that the main thing in worship is, is God. Um, right. That it's always focused it's on God. It's got to be the focus. Yeah. And, and you know, we talked a little, bit, a little bit about that last week, that it, it's, it's not about making myself the center of the universe. Um, that, that if I place myself at the center of the universe and everything has to uh, cater to me and has to make sure that then, then whenever, uh, whenever we sing a song that, that I'm not a big fan of or, or, or a song that, that, that I don't really get the, the emotional sense from, then yeah, it becomes an issue for me because yeah. now it's, well, I don't get anything from that song. I don't, I, instead of, of, even if it's not, like, even if it doesn't hit the emotional button for me, um, still looking at the song, still seeing the, um, the theology in the song, still seeing those things that, that, that really drive, why is the song written? What is behind the song? Those are some of the things that I think that, that we can really take and we can really grasp hold of, as opposed to, like, kind of like you were saying, as opposed to just sitting back and, and you know, maybe, maybe it's a criticism or maybe we just shut off mentally, um, those types of things that, that we're driven by who it is that the song is about, not who it is that the song is being sung in the direction of, I guess we can say. Right, and truth is... I believe, critically important in worship. And we don't think about this enough. A lot of times we go with fads. Right now, there's a song called Reckless Love. Big deal, right? I mean, it's a big deal, a lot of church. And, and the thing is, I love 99% of that song. What I don't like is the title of the song. Yeah. And I don't like saying that God's love is reckless because I can't, in my mind, find a category for that. And we may disagree or disagree on this, I don't know. But, um, you know, I, as I read that phrase, I don't come away thinking that that's accurate, an accurate, I know what they're trying to get at, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but of course our language is tied down to words and the context, and, and the context kind of softens it because mm -hmm. it helps us to understand that God goes after that one, he leaves the 99 and he goes after that one, and that may on the appearance seem reckless to some, uh, but of course, if you just go with the definition of what the word means, it, I, I don't think it means what we want it to mean. And so, so that's, that's why we probably won't be singing that song at our church as much as, you know, I love 99.9% .9 of that song. Um, so truth is important in worship, and that's not really one that I think is going to damage the church as much as perhaps some others. Um, and sometimes there's truths that we sing that are hard, more difficult to sing like, you know, for example, uh, the song uh, Christ in Christ Alone. Mm -hmm. and talks about how the wrath of God is being poured out and some denomination didn't want to include that and asked to not include that. And the Gettys were like, no, we've we got to include that. That's truth. It's based on Scripture. And so I agree with Matt. Scripture is our guideline. It, it kind of gives a frame, a lane for us to run in. And we're free to move within that lane but uh, we can't get outside of that lane and just start making stuff up and saying, well, God gave a direct revelation to me, and, and so this is the direction we're going to head in. And uh, so, yeah, th this is our anchor and the guideline for worship. Yeah, well, and, 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 and Daryl being, being so courteous to, to run the, the technical stuff in the back, because if I was running that, we'd never get this thing off the ground. Um, but but he, he chimed in, he said, our corporate worship should be an overflow of our personal lifestyle of worship that happens on a daily basis. I like that, daily basis there, Daryl. Um, if we get hung up on our own personal tastes and preferences, it smacks of the selfishness of our own hearts. It is not about us. It should be a holy, it should, it, it should be a holy God. Um, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, and you, you know, you, you said you don't know if we agree or disagree. And, and I honestly, I'll tell you, I don't know if we do agree or disagree either. Cause I, <laughs> every time, every time that I have this debate about reckless love, I think I fall on a, in a, in a different area sure. because I think, I think it's, each, a, it's a tough one. Yeah. Each time that, each time that I do that, it, I feel like it, it does it. it I, I see a different side. I see a different point. You know, I, I think you and I talked last Wednesday, um, about the fact that we can't see God as a whole. Um, we can't even describe God as all. If we put every word in the English language together and uh, you could you put them all together, English, Greek, Hebrew, put them all together, no matter what order we put them in, we couldn't possibly still describe all of God. And so I think there are times when we take elements of God and, and we try our best to describe elements of God. And so in, I, I think when, when they sing Reckless Love, it, it, you know, I, I look at it and say, okay, I understand where they're going. Kind of like what you said, the context itself the wording may be a little bit different, but the context itself does soften that a tad. Um, you know, I, I think um, that, that uh, you know, the, the Merriam-Webster definition of, of reckless is um, marked by lack of 
proper caution, um, careless of consequences. Um, and, and, and so I think, I think when you initially talked about it, you know, because there, there is a second definition which says irresponsible. I think, I think if we look at it and we say irresponsible, yeah, that's, that's obviously not it. Right. Um, I, I don't think there's a way that God can be irresponsible. Um, but I, I can see it in the sense of throwing caution to the wind and going out, leaving the 99 to go get the one. Sure. Um, and, and, and so I do have one of those things where it, it is a little interesting for me because I understand what he's trying to say. Sure. Because when you and look I at that, too. I, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and so I, I I don't know. I I've, my, I, I my always big, come down on a different. My problem one. with reckless love is that's the title of the song. Like yeah. I never hear the word reckless. Yeah. Like if I were to say you're a reckless driver, like that's not a compliment. No. That, that's not a good thing. It's yeah. just, and that's the way I think it naturally strikes us. Reckless mm -hmm. is not good, mm -hmm. and passionate love, absolutely. Zealous love. For sure. Reckless, I, that's a negative word. The majority of, I, I, I'm, I don't know that I've ever used that word in a positive way um, to say that somebody's being reckless. Uh, it's at best neutral to negative. And so I could probably manage it if that were like one phrase, like one line in the song, like, okay, you just push through that line. We realize that the songs we sing on Sunday morning are not uh, inerrant. It's not God's word uh, in the sense of what scripture is. And so maybe we can just push through it. But when it's the title of the song, and that is the way everything is framed, I don't think him leaving the 99 and going for the one is reckless. I think it's him being a good shepherd and him being passionate to not lose one. I think that's the whole point is each individual person is loved by God. And here's where Matt can chime in. Each individual oh, he's person been chiming in already. is loved by God. And so the good shepherd is going to go and save the one and leave the 99. And of course, no analogy is perfect because God, um, God is with us, okay? He's not gonna leave me to go save somebody else. So the point of that analogy is that each individual matters to God and the shepherd's going to go and pursue and bring back that sheep that's lost. Well, and I like that. It, and I, I think that's the deal. Is I, I think now... now I, got we a, come, I got a thumbs up we, from Daryl. got so. a thumbs up from absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I, and, and I think now we start to get to, to the heart of something, though. And, and, and this is where I think the conversation really does change, is that um, it's not reckless for God to leave the 99 and go get the one. Because yeah. if it was reckless for God to go and get the one... Um, it would mean that his presence would leave the 99 to go get the one. And, right. and song I never have in my entire life used the word reckless in a positive way and so I love the majority of that song I just mm -hmm. don't like the core title of it and so I just I do sing it and when I get to that my kids get on to me because I just change the word to something else and <laughs> sing overwhelming love or or perfect love or something I, I, like I think, that. I, I think I think that I, I've Maybe done that. Maybe we should do that just in, install our own word. <laughs> I, you know it's funny I'll, I'll find myself at times I'll be I'll be kind of singing it in my office and and I won't realize that I'm singing it I don't even realize what song it is that I'm singing and and I'll say perfect love and I'll go that's right, but it doesn't sound right. It's like, the, I know the words are right, but like the, the and then you I go, oh, wait a minute, I'm singing Reckless Love. Oh, okay, I see what it is. You can't sing that song with Matt in your office. You know, there's lots of things I'm not probably. supposed to sing with Matt in my office, and yet I do anyway. Um, but no, no, that, that's, um, it, but it's good though. I, 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 I like that, that discussion, because that is one of those things. You know, you'll, you'll hear it a lot about, uh, you'll hear people talk about the theology of contemporary music a lot, and I find at times there's not, there, there is some grounds, but people don't always know. They're kind of repeating what it is they've heard, but I, I think that is. That's a, that's a yeah. good one to be able to, to define and describe. Yeah. Um, the, so, so, but speaking of something else, that, right. that I, I thought this was really interesting because you and I have had this conversation before. I've used this reference before. I think lots of people use this reference before, and we don't necessarily know where it comes from. 
Um, you talked about in the service. Uh, you talked about um, that the, the high priest, when he entered the Holy of Holies, that he had a, a rope tied to his ankle. Right. Um, and I thought, it, I, it was, I thought it was interesting because it, it's kind of a, um, uh, now we can look at it and it's kind of comical. It's like, man, the guy had a rope tied to his ankle. But I mean, could you imagine, could you imagine the fear? That it wasn't your, comical for him. That, yeah, it's not comical <laughs> for him. Because if, if there is any part of you that is not prepared to go into the Holy of Holies, that is, that is not clean, that is not pure, you're going to drop dead when you get in there. I mean, I mean we right. see that, that when people were, were carrying the ark, um, that, that as, the, as it slipped and they reached out to, to hold the ark to keep it from hitting the yeah. ground. Yeah, I thought of that. Yeah. They died. Yeah. Like they were trying to do something good, but, mm-hmm. but yet, it, and, and, and just one of those things that I've, I've kind of learned through my time in seminary is that it, that, that it was more clean for the ark to actually hit the ground, the, the, the created ground, than it was for them to put their, I guess, you know, grubby little hands. That's yeah. probably not the right way to say it, but their, well, their grubby little hands true. on it. Um, it probably, you know, serves well to illustrate the fact that he knew he wasn't supposed to be where he found himself yeah. in Isaiah 6 to be in the heavenly uh, courtroom oh, yeah. and to realize just how ruined and unclean he was especially in a lot of uh, stories like what you just told. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and so we, we see this, though, and here you go, um, because we look at it and we go, you know, we hear that a ton, and it's kind of one of those things that it's like it's got to be in the Bible somewhere, right, uh, about the rope around the ankle, excuse me, and, and it's actually not. It's actually not. Um, but, but I he, said something that was unbiblical. That <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if you said something that was unbiblical, but you, you, you didn't exactly claim that it was like out of Leviticus. About to bur- burst oh, yeah, he's door yeah, any moment. Now. Yeah, yeah, that's just, <laughs> it, we're, we're, about, we're probably about to start getting a call. We're going to have to put him online. Um, but however, it, there, there is a, um, it does come from uh, Rabbi Yitzchak. Okay, um, because Good what it is, 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 is it, and, and, and Matt's, Matt's about to go nuts with this, but um, uh, <laughs> it, it, is, it is from, the, um, from the, the tradition of Jewish rabbis, that, that, that as they came down, or as it has been passed down, is that that's what happened, because, and you brought this up too, is that you only went to the Holy Holies once a year, and they weren't going to wait um, a whole year to send in the new high priest right, yeah. with, with the, the, the old high priest to drag you out. Because once again, as soon as he touched a dead he body, he was unclean. <laughs> uh, could you imagine the pile of bodies that would stack up after that? Um, yeah. But, but it, here's, here's, what, here's what Rabbi Yitzchak says. I, I, I know I'm not saying that right, but he says, uh, according to the account of our rabbis preserved in the Talmud, the high priest wore a rope around his waist as he made his way absolutely alone into the Holy of Holies. The rope he wore served a very practical purpose because in the event that the high priest said or did something wrong, it was generally believed that he would be struck dead for his offense. Yes, right then and there. As only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the rope, the rope enabled his assistants to safely pull the corpse of the high priest out of the inner sanctum in the event of a mishap. Um, so so we, we do have that. We, we have... Um, a, a tradition that says that even though it's, you know, because I was like, oh, surely that's in Leviticus somewhere, um, and, and it's not, but we, but we have a little bit there. So I, I, I thought that was, uh, I thought it was interesting yeah. um, that, that there was that. And, and, and so, a bit scary, you know. Oh, and, and not just a bit scary. It's quite a bit scary, <laughs> a lot scary. Um, but it leads me to this next one, though. It leads me to the next one. Coming back to Isaiah 6, when you, were, when you were reading that and talking about it, something struck me that was... Um, I don't really have any profound thoughts. I usually have funny thoughts, not profound thoughts, but something that I thought was kind of cool um, was that, and I'm not saying that the, the, the coal itself was Jesus, but the coal acted in the same way that Jesus acts on our hearts to bring us close to God. Because otherwise, if we didn't have Jesus, we could not approach God. Um, that separation is too great. It is, it is a point that we can't overcome a- in the same way that, that he said, woe is me. I mean, you were talking about it. He, he knew he was in a bad spot because he was somewhere that he probably wouldn't be, be allowed yeah. to be. Um, and, and so um, the, 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 the coal, uh, the, the angel touched the coal to his lips and he was, he was clean. He was yes. cleansed. He was, he was mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know if we could use the word justified. I think that's the one that, that I need you and Matt for. If we could use the word justified or sanctified in that moment or whatever. But, um, and, and, and so that's what prevented him from dropping dead. Um, in, in, in the, and so he, he didn't need, uh, I mean, not that, you know, rope and ankle and all that, but, but that, that's what prevented, in the same way. And so that's what made him able to stand in the presence yes. of God in the same way that Jesus' righteousness is what allows us to stand in the presence of God. Right. You know, it says, he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. 
And what's fascinating about this is, you know, a lot of times we think unclean things can't enter the presence of God because somehow God is going to be threatened or endangered by uh, something that's unclean or sinful. In this situation, it's revealed to us that actually it's the sin itself that's endangered being in the presence of God. It's not God that's, uh, that's endangered in any way. And so, you know, th- this leads us to that point of repent or perish, of either you cling to that sin your entire life and you, go, you perish with it, or uh, you repent, you turn away from it and turn to the living God and live. And this is something I think we see replete throughout the pages of the Bible. But in this situation, it was a holiness of God that, to use a, a, a different word, that influenced him, that basically rather than him contaminating the holy place, he was contaminated by the holiness of God. Um, in a sense, only contaminates not that. It's kind, of, it's kind of like using the word reckless. <laughs> so, so let's not, uh, let me recant from saying that. But, uh, but that's effectively what happened. The holiness of God uh, spread to him rather than his uncleanliness spread to God. And just so it shows the power of God's holiness and, uh, and the power of his atonement. Well, and, and, and wrapped in that thought, I, that, that's fantastic because you said it that way. I hadn't thought about that, but wrapped in that thought, how often have we heard um, about, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll hear, hear uh, testimonies or we'll hear songs or, or however it functions. Um, we'll hear about someone trying to clean themselves up or they're too, they're too yeah. bad to go to church. Right. They've got too much bad going on in their lives. They need to get this right. And that's not it at all. It, it, it's not that you have to. It's not that you have to be qualified to to arrive. Um, it, it's that you show up unqualified. I think you and I even at this point still feel unqualified. You show up unqualified, and that it is God that God's holiness that envelops you, that wraps you, um, and 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 begins to sanctify and cleanse you in that way. Yeah, and it goes back to that self-centered mindset. People who say, "Well, I can't come and worship God because of what I've done." Again, they're not focused on God. They're focused on self. God is worthy of worship regardless of who we are or what we've done. And worst part of worshiping him is letting go of that self, denying self, and turning to Christ. And because God is worthy regardless of what's going on in my life. And so, yes, maybe I've lived for the devil all week long. And then when it comes Sunday, I'm reminded, man, I, I haven't lived for God all week this week. I can't go to worship Reality is you need to go to worship because, you know, in worship, a lot of times we think that we're the most active participant in worship, and we've talked about this, but it's actually God who's the most active participant in worship. He's changing our hearts. He's changing us and molding us as we delight in him, as we love him, as we contemplate who he is and think God's thoughts after him. God works on our hearts, on our minds, and as you said, he, he just you know, enraptures us and draws us to himself. And this is one of the powerful benefits of worshiping God as he changes us to be more like him. That's uh, uh, pretty amazing. And, and so now, as I as I kind of turn to turn to the camera here, uh, allow me to say that that if you're if you're watching this, um, if you're someone who has stumbled upon this video, maybe a friend shared it, however it functions, um, you don't you don't have to clean yourself up. Uh, you, you don't have to come in wearing a three piece suit. You don't have to come in with no sin in your life. Um, we are here because we aren't we aren't able to clean ourselves up in that way. Um, that, that is why we have Jesus. That is what Jesus died on the cross for. So do me a favor. Um, if, if you're feeling a little bit of that, that, that thing in the back of your mind, that thing in the back of your heart, uh, uh, wondering about church, um, do me a favor that, that Taylor's Valley Baptist Church would love to have you on Sunday mornings. Um, we would love to have you be here. We'd love to worship with you. We'd love to talk to you. If you've got any questions at all, you can feel free to email me, kyle at tvbc.net. That's just K-Y-L-E at tvbc.net. Um, I'll be happy to, to forward anything over to, to Matt or Jared or Daryl. Uh, if it's a question that, that you'd like to talk to them about or that, that I can't answer, um, but we would, we would love to have you come and worship with us. Uh, we have a, a, a great and loving church uh, and, and would just love to, to, to kind of show you what we're all about. So uh, that happens at 1030 on Sunday mornings. That's when our worship service starts. We have life groups that start at 915 on Sunday morning. I uh, would love for you to come be a part of that. You just walk in the main doors of the church and somebody will be there to, uh, to direct you wherever it is that you're looking to go. Um, but Brother Jared, I, 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 you know, I see Matt's no longer with us. I think he probably had something to go do up in, uh, up in Ohio. Um, you, you have anything else? 
Yeah, I, I do want to just point out that the holiness of God and the love of God, that was one of the big things that struck me in studying God's holiness. They're not polar opposites, that yes, God is a holy God, and that is perfectly compatible with uh, the fact that God is a loving God. And one of my favorite uh, quotes in all of this is from um, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, where he said, both the holiness and the happiness of the Godhead consist in, his, in this love. As we've already proved, all creature holiness consists essentially and summarily in love to God and love to other creatures. So does the holiness of God consist in his love, especially in the perfect and intimate union and love there is between the Father and Son. That's one of the magnificent things that we read in the Bible. Is this holiness is not something that is uh, against uh, God's love. It doesn't conflict with it in any way. Uh, God is holy precisely because God is love. And so, uh, you know, sometimes people feel like they can't be part of a church family because God is this angry tyrant up in heaven and, you know, just looking down upon them and, and condemning them. But Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. It actually says, God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. Uh, so he didn't come to condemn us. He came uh, to save us from perishing. He came to give, came to give us life. And uh, so that's one of the powerful messages that we find in the Bible. Man, God, God is holy precisely because God is love. That's going Absolutely. on my Facebook page. That's, that, that's a Facebook quote. So um, thank you so much for joining us today uh, uh, here with, with uh, Jared Burt, the pastor at Taylor's Valley Baptist Church. Like I said, love to have you back on, on Sunday at 1030. Uh, we'll be right back here at noon on Monday.